Hello, I'm John Nichols, and for 42 years, I was an English GP or family doctor in my hometown of Guildford, which is near London. So I have a question for you, and it's about history. Now, I'm not a historian. I'm just a straightforward medical man, semi-retired, still busy doing research and writing. And um, the only history I know about is medical history. So this is my question for you. Here it comes. Do great men change the course of history? And because I'm not a historian, but I do know quite a lot about the history of medicine, I'm going to look mainly at men and women in medical history. So a variant is, do great men of the world of medicine uh, change the course of medical history? And because I'm English, there's a significant European bias. So I do apologize in advance to people from the other side of the world. So, Thomas Carlyle, a Scottish philosopher of the 18th and 19th century, um, was very keen on this theory of the great men of history. He said, they were the leaders of men, these great ones, the modelers, patterns, and in a wide sense, creators of whatever the general mass of men contrived to do or to attain. All things that we see standing accomplished in the world are properly the outer material result, the practical realization and embodiment of thoughts that dwelt in the great men sent into the world. The soul of the whole world's history, it may justly be considered with the history of these. And here you see he is giving Napoleon Bonaparte as an example. And Napoleon Bonaparte, of course, uh, as a saying, all political careers end in failure. Well, his certainly did. Though he did shake things up a good deal but there's a good argument that if it hadn't have been him, it would have been another uh, leading Frenchman at the time, like Marshal Ney, who had just done the same job. And this is what the opponents, uh, such as Herbert Spencer, were saying, look, these so-called so great men um, are not as great as you make out, because if they hadn't been born, somebody else would have stepped into the breach and done pretty much the same job. And this certainly applies to political creatures like Napoleon Bonaparte, but what about William Shakespeare? Could there be another William Shakespeare if he'd never been born? I think that would have led a significant gap. And maybe the William Shakespeare's of the world have a bigger impact than the Bonaparte's of the world. So let us then consider my medical heroes. And he has a list of them, starting with Hippocrates, the father of medicine of the ancient world, going through some well-known ones like um, William Harvey, Louis Pasteur, Florence Nightingale, and some less known ones. There are 11 altogether. I could have made a longer list, but these are my, my front runners, shall we say. So let's make a start on this. But before we go to Hippocrates, let's consider that before Hippocrates, there were great medical men that we don't know the names of, going back into very, very ancient history and prehistory, because this uh, Ebers Papyrus was found in Egypt in 1987. It dates back three and a half thousand years to 1500 BC. And it is quite a remarkable document because Egyptian medical science was actually quite advanced 
There were 180, uh, 877 prescriptions on the Ebers papyrus that were with some difficulty deciphered. And it was found that 64% of them were had an efficiency on a par with drugs used in the last 60 years. In fact, 62% of the ingredients on the Ebers papyrus could be found in the 1977 Martindale edition of the complete drug reference. Not so many in the year uh, 2021, but 1977 isn't that long ago. And another interesting statistic is that there are about five times as many uh, prescription drugs now as the 877 prescriptions in the Ebers virus. It's taken us three and a half thousand years to um, multiply by five, which is a long time. So getting on to the great man himself, Hippocrates, who did draw upon the uh, Egyptian legacy. Um, he is well known for being a great champion of nutritional medicine. Uh, he's, he, he advised before you start taking herbal remedies, consider your diet. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. One of his many wise sayings. He had an opinion about science too. He said, science is the father of knowledge but opinion breeds ignorance. He might have said, but mere opinion breeds ignorance or unsupported opinion breeds ignorance. And um, uh, that is the basis of a lot of scientific thinking. So he was a man ahead of his time, uh, not initially perhaps uh, recognized as uh, he deserved, but eventually, eventually, um, recognized and, and almost worshipped as a god, so that when he died, there was a great wailing and gnashing of teeth, and oh, the, the life will never be the same, now great, the great Hippocrates has gone. So he was the first person to believe that diseases were caused naturally, not because of superstitions or the supernatural causes. Uh, epilepsy being an example was thought to be sent from the gods. It was uh, the the holy disease um, sent by the gods. He said, no, 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 there's this a natural explanation for it. We may not know yet what it is, but eventually we'll, we will understand what the natural explanation is for epilepsy. And he came up with, with treatments for it and rather than um, uh, praying to the gods. And in fact, he repudiated the need for prayer as part of the healing process, which was actually quite scandalous at the time. And, and it was rejected by a, a large part of society and, and deemed blasphemous by the state. Well, allegedly for this, Hippocrates spent 20 years in prison. That though actually, um, I, I've read around this topic quite a lot. And this was in, in a book um, by a, a doctor, a Roman doctor about 500 years later. And, um, uh, he may have been inaccurate, and some experts tell me that imprisonment for 20 years was very unlikely. There might have been a prolonged period of house arrest or something, but 20 years, even then, uh, no, that is probably a, a bit of a myth. And there were myths surrounding the great man, but uh, a lot of it is there in the Hippocratic corpus. It's, it's there, it is his own words, and, and um, those of his uh, assistants, including his two sons. <clears throat> so the Hippocratic corpus is not all uh, Hippocrates himself, but it, it is based on Hippocrates uh, and uh, it is pretty sound stuff considering how long ago it was. Uh, here are some of his um, innovations. Well, first of all, you have the Hippocratic bench used for uh, treating spinal injuries which is like the rack, but a little gentler, perhaps. Now, here's a, uh, below that a Hippocratic manipulation for a, a dislocated shoulder. Um, <clears throat> you can see he's um, stretching the arm with the help of his assistant, who's hanging on to the patient to counterweight until uh, the 
joint pops back. He also was known to be pretty good on psychiatry, so that when the people of Abdera uh, were worried about Democritus, their um, local philosopher, who was uh, well respected, he, but he was coming up with some pretty crazy ideas, um, like that the world is round and it floats in boundless space, and all the matter is made up of tiny little particles called atoms. Uh, you know, I think he, he, he's a great man, but he, he's losing his mind. Some of these ideas are just crazy. So they called for Hippocrates, and Hippocrates had quite a long chat on his own with, with Democritus. And when he came out, he said, well, uh, I don't, I don't I can't decipher Greek, but to paraphrase, he said, people of Abdera, uh, Democritus, your citizen Democritus is perfectly sane. Um, and he is a great genius. And you should be grateful that you have a great man like Democritus amongst you. So that was that. Um, if Hippocrates gives you a clean ticket for sanity, that's an end to it. Um, he was not only the father of medicine, using observation and very careful note-taking. So the idea that you should do this, you should take notes on every case you see and see if you can find a common thread that goes right through, which might uh, be significant and give rise to some theory as to, to what linked all these different case histories. Uh, this was new. And epidemiology, he was very widely traveled. He, he, he studied people in different environments and he made notes on alcohol intake, lifestyle, geographical location in relation to fertility, um, mortality, morbidity. He, he was very thorough. He was uh, meticulous in the details he made. And all this was new and laid the foundations for, well, it laid the foundations for modern medicine, really, if you think about it, because it's a, a small logical step to what we now call quantitative research and qualitative research. Quantitative research is a matter of, of counting, as in these large randomized control trials. <coughs> qualitative research, perhaps a bit closer to what Hippocrates was doing, give Hippocrates a tape machine, and, and he would have loved it, I'm sure, to um, make his own uh, recordings as he went around like a detective speaking into a dictaphone or making recordings of patients' record of, of their experience of their disorder. Um, and uh, even more so, perhaps, an offshoot of that narrative research, which means giving the head of steam in tie to the patient, get the patient's narrative, and then uh, analyze that. And uh, if you've got enough patients, again, looking for a common th thread running through the different stories, you, know, you have found something of importance. So th this would be a Hippocratic approach, but I'm jumping ahead of myself because uh, Hippocrates didn't develop these techniques. I'm just saying it seems only a short step away from what Hippocrates was doing. And yet it was hundreds of years before that step was taken. So after Greece and Rome, uh, of course, things went downhill. But uh, again, I mustn't jump ahead of myself because one of the best known physicians, another Greek, uh, was uh, Galen, who was called to the Roman court, of uh, Marcus Aurelius, one of the greatest um, emperors of the Roman Empire. And he served uh, Commodus and another, um, uh, whoever, uh, two, three Roman emperors altogether anyway. And uh, he was undoubtedly a highly skilled surgeon. He uh, dissected animals, but he wasn't allowed to dissect human bodies at the time. Uh, this came and went at the time, it would have been illegal. But he, he made some terrible mistakes, did Galen. And because he was uh, considered such a great man, everybody believed his mistakes. And, and the worst one was to say the arterial circulation, the venous circulation were completely separate the blood pumped blood through the arteries to all the main organs of the body 
and any excess came out through the fingertips. Now that seems obviously wrong to us now, and yet because the great Galen had said it, that was accepted uh, as unquestionable for over a thousand years. However, uh, that's in, in Europe. Um, in, in the Muslim world, in, in the Middle East, uh, Avicenna was hailed as a, a second Hippocrates, and he was a great philosopher and doctor. So Avicenna is, is my next great man of medicine. And the reason why he is so important and has made an impact on history, in my opinion, is that he preserved uh, the Hippocratic principles and, and developed them a little further during the Dark Ages in the 10th century uh, and uh, preserved them through to the Renaissance uh, when uh, the Arabic science and uh, medical science was passed on to the thinkers of the Renaissance. However, meanwhile, in the Middle Ages, things weren't so bright. Um, advances were very slow due to the suspicions of the church, but the basic principles of modern science perhaps were developed, being developed by thinkers such as William of Ockham, um, famously known for Ockham's razor, which is the idea of how to prevent a theory from becoming overcomplicated, particularly any, any superstitious hangers-on uh, should be shaved off. Um, but generally speaking, uh, such ideas weren't put into practice in any very impressive way. In fact, if you were a healer, um, you were taking risks. And here's my next hero, who you won't have heard of, Jacqueline Felice de Alemania, who was put on trial in 1322 because although she was an Italian physician from Florence and had moved to Paris, the Faculty of Medicine and the University of Paris um, and the church wanted to um, convict her of practicing medicine without being qualified. Well, they just didn't accept her qualification. And most of all, they didn't accept that a woman could be a doctor. And what really damned her was that six witnesses affirmed that she had cured them even after numerous doctors had, had given up, which proved her guilt, her success proved her guilt. And she was banned from practicing and threatened with excommunication. She was not accused of being a witch. And even if she had, she would not have been burned at the stake then. That came later. But throughout the Middle Ages, this was a risk, as I say. Um, why were they so rigid in the Middle Ages? Um, there was a lot of economic insecurity and petty wars, and anybody who stuck their neck out uh, with uh, new ideas uh, might upset the apple cart and, and cause real problems socioeconomically. So in a way it was understandable, but it was unfortunate, particularly if uh, uh, harmless healers were accu who accused of being witches. And, the village midwife in particular was at risk and, and here's the village midwife delivering a baby there's somebody there watching her carefully to make sure she behaves herself there's the mother and there's i i, I imagine the sister or grandmother and um the paranoid church and town officials uh, often accused herbalists of witchcraft because herbology had its origins in paganism and the power of good Christian prayer was considered preferable. There was a, a difference of opinion here because uh, take the monasteries. Some monasteries had herbal gardens. Other monasteries uh, were told, the monks were told, you don't go to see a doctor because uh, you're a servant of God. You pray to God and he will heal you. You don't need to see a doctor which is a bit like uh, Christian scientists. And that, that was a widespread attitude. And uh, going on, and now we're into the early Renaissance, 1486, and when the, uh, it was printing. So here's the book, Malleus Maleficarum, which 
uh, contained detailed processes for seeking out and destroying witches. The authors feared and warned against women who posed as healers and midwives and used the opportunity to work evil. I think this distinction between uh, true healers and witches probably did little to prevent harm coming to harmless women. So I mustn't go off at a tangent because we're talking about great men and women. I just want to point out, uh, this is the background against which um, it's all happening. And in fact, uh, up to, uh, this is late Middle Age, uh, early Renaissance, um, you have anatomists who are reading from the anatomical treatise of uh, Roman uh, Galen again, whilst his minions follow his instructions. Here he is sitting up here in his, his enthronement in like a high chair looking down on the body of this uh, condemned criminal who's now dead and being dissected and his minions are getting their, their hands dirty and when he went he's just reading out from and from Galen and saying this is what you'll find here and this is what you'll find there and uh, they have to jolly well find it. Um, this is not the way to conduct science or medical science is it? It's completely wrong and some people about the time were pointing it out, particularly my next hero, Paracelsus. He was a Renaissance traveling physician from Switzerland who rejected Aristotle and Galen for their many errors, including Galen's uh, dodgy anatomy and Aristotle's dodgy ideas about um, uh, life being generated in warm mud and uh, things of this sort, spontaneous generation, he called it. Uh, he, he saw through these falsities and Aristotle and Galen, the church, um, would not accept that they could say anything wrong. So he was taking a bit of a risk saying these things. And indeed, this is why he, he was a traveling physician. He kept having to move on. He made himself unpopular. Also, he believed that minerals such as sulfur and mercury, which, which were poisons, but when given in small doses, he said they had healing effects. <clears throat> For instance, he showed that syphilis can be controlled with small doses of mercury salts. And, and this also got him into trouble with, with other doctors because he managed to heal patients, treat patients who had um, come to him because no other doctor was able to help them. And uh, this made him so unpopular in, in some cities that eventually, in fear of his life, he had to move on quickly. And here is the man himself. Yeah, I like the hat. Um, died in 1541, still in the Renaissance, so in the middle of the Renaissance. Things, despite Paracelsus and other anti-Galenists, didn't really move rapidly until the Enlightenment, 200 years later. Um, about the same time, Andreas Vesalius, another Renaissance man, born in Brussels and stayed most of his life in Belgium, um, was also doubting Galen. He used his influence as an anatomist. You see he's allowed to dissect human bodies there. He, he published many books on anatomy and he uh, was supported by the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, who helped him to, to fight the Galenists and the Inquisition. The Inquisition had a nasty habit of burning his books. And if they could have got his hands on him, they'd probably have burned him too, uh, beginning to burn people by then. Uh, well, for some time, in fact. It, it, the burning of people they didn't like reached its, its zenith um, in the uh, 16th and 17th century. <coughs> Amongst other achievements, he worked with the Venetians, Venice, to get a, a better understanding of how to control the spread of bubonic plague. So 
his fame had, had spread far and wide. Unfortunately, on the way back from, from Venice, he was shipwrecked and he died shortly afterwards in 1564. Here's my next um, hero moving towards uh, the Enlightenment. He, uh, William Harvey, was Charles I's personal doctor. So uh, when Charles I lost his head, there wasn't much um, Harvey could do about that. In the meantime, he is remembered for his work on the heart and circulation. But before we get on to that, uh, I sh I'd like to point out that he was a prominent skeptic uh, regarding allegations of witchcraft. And Charles I appointed him as one of the examiners of four women from Lancashire accused of witchcraft in 1634. And as a consequence of his report, all of them were acquitted and sent home. I, I imagine uh, he warned them to behave better and, and, and not shout at naughty children or whatever it was that had got them into trouble in the first place. And uh, the great breakthrough was his book, The Mortu Cordis, uh, or On the Motions of the Heart and Blood, in which he demonstrated uh, in a way which was difficult to disagree, that Galen had got it completely wrong, and that the volume of blood pumped by the heart at the rate at which it pumped couldn't possibly be contained within the body unless it was recirculated. And of course, with the help of micro the, the very, very early microscopes, they could see these tiny little capillary vessels that joined the arterial side with the venous side. So blood circulated around the, the body and came back to the heart. Had to be true. And it's amazing that for over a thousand years, uh, that couldn't be seen. So that made a big difference, I believe. He died in Roehampton, which is just down the road from where I am in, in Guildford, Surrey. Um, a little later on, overlapping with him, uh, and he, this is really an enlightenment man, Francesco Reddy is my next hero. And you may not have heard of him, but he carried out the first controlled experiment. Um, he was a proper experimenter. And we don't know anything about experiments of this sort being done in the ancient world. I can't believe that it was never done. And in fact, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that they experimented on slaves, but there's no record of it, so I could be wrong. So this experiment was an experiment to test Aristotle's theory of spontaneous generation, that maggots uh, just come to life out of uh, rotting flesh. And here is the rotting flesh in, in the three experiments in, in the jam jar. If you keep a lid on a jam jar, you don't get any maggots. If you leave the lid off completely and let flies visit it, lo and behold, maggots appear. If you have tightly applied fine gauze over it, the flies buzz around trying to get to the meat, um, but they can't, and, and they lay eggs on the gauze and the, the eggs hatch out into little tiny maggots which shrivel up and die. So that was proof that Aristotle was wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, and he published that in 1668. And that established what we now know as the life cycle of the fly. And you can see how this relates to Louis Pasteur's great experiment in 1860 and that shows that air contains invisible microbes. Uh, we know, we call them now bacteria and viruses, but it was mainly bacteria that he demonstrated. Um, this was an idea that was vaguely around uh, for at least a hundred years, but it was rejected as superstitious nonsense by hard-nosed uh, scientists and medical men, where's the evidence? This is just uh, like believing in ghosts, for goodness sake, you know. But this is what um, 
Pasteur did. He, he took a nutrient broth and sterilized it by uh, heating it up to um, run about just under boiling point uh, for some time, which would kill any microbes uh, in the broth, so it was sterile. And then um, the swan neck, swan neck flask, you call it, um, is, is sealed, so no air can get in. And it, it stays nice and transparent and pure. No spoilage. Then he breaks the swan neck, and in a, within a very short time, you get spoilage. And if you, you take a sample of that, you can see it's, it's full of, with a microscope, uh, lots of little bacteria swimming around, which weren't there before. So um, he did lots of experiments along these lines, just to be certain that everybody now believed that the, the um, Aristotle's idea has now got to be totally rejected. Um, despite Francesca Reddy, uh, people still clung to it. But now with Pasteur, they had to admit that he was wrong and Reddy and Pasteur were right. So what would have happened without Louis Pasteur? Well, it would have made an enormous difference, um, not least for a, a distant ancestor of mine, uh, Joseph Lister, who uh, a, a colleague uh, told him to read a paper by Louis Pasteur, and that was his eureka moment for, for Joseph Lister. He realized that this finding tied in with his understanding of how wounds get infected, particularly um, wounds following open surgery, which was a major cause of death. You have your operation, technically it's a success, the wound gets infected, you develop septicemia and you die. So very common. So he developed an aseptic technique, but I don't believe that Joseph Lister clever guy though he was, an ancestor of mine, that I claim, I don't think he could ever have made that leap unless he had read the work of Louis Pasteur. They did indeed become good friends um, and uh, some lovely stories about um, how they interacted later in life. So starting with Hippocrates, uh, New research methodology was now growing out of the, the Hippocratic tradition of observation, um, which involved experimentation. Uh, Francesca Reddy did experiments. Uh, Joseph and Agnes Lister, his wife, was a, a, a major factor in all this. Let's, let's not, not forget the importance of the, um, the lady in the story. Um, and Edward Jenner did a very important experiment without which things could have been very different. So here he is, um, we're moving into the, the from the uh, 18th to the 19th century here in his lifetime. Uh, he, he was uh, a, a well-known doctor and he corresponded with another well-known doctor the grandfather of Charles Darwin, Erasmus Darwin. Now, Jenner had some ideas about milkmaids, cowpox, and their being protected from smallpox. Um, this was an idea that was around in the farming community that, that there's nothing wrong with catching cowpox. It's a little unpleasant, but it protects you against smallpox and what could be done to protect everybody from smallpox. And he kept writing to uh, Darwin letters and uh, coming up with new ideas and new reports of this. And in the end, Darwin got a bit fed up and said, for goodness sake, Ed, stop prevaricating and do an experiment. And of course, he did his famous experiment. Um, one of his patients, Sarah Sells, was indeed a milkmaid. 
and she caught cowpox from one of her cows. And that's always in the hands because they're, they're milking uh, with their hands. And he took some um, scabby pussy matter from uh, Sarah Selms and inoculated, use it to inoculate little James Phipps, Jamie Phipps. He is, he is a hero of this story. And I, I'm rather taken to little Jamie there. He's got a lovely smile, hasn't he? And he was, in fact, the gardener of uh, Dr. Jenner. And then, uh, given time, uh, a year or so, I think it was, he waited until he had a patient come to him with smallpox. So he took some pussy scabby matter from uh, the smallpox patient and a second time now inoculated uh, little Jamie Phipps. And you can see Jamie is still smiling because he it didn't do anything to him. He didn't develop smallpox. In fact, it's quite obvious he was immune to smallpox because he'd been vaccinated. And this hit the headlines, led to a great campaign because millions of people were dying of smallpox at the time. Made an enormous difference to millions of lives. My next hero is Florence Nightingale, who you think of as the lady with the lamp of the Crimean War. And indeed, that's what she was to the, the newspapers who sold her story, um, how she went around assiduously uh, inspecting her soldier patients, her wounded soldiers. And it was a heartwarming story, but there's a heck of a lot more to Florence Nightingale. And not least of which, she was a mathematical genius. Um, when she got back from Crimea, she'd taken, um, in the Hippocratic tradition, she had taken loads of notes and uh, mathematical data from her hospital and her soldier patients. And she was appalled to find on analyzing these that many of the deaths of her soldiers were due to the insanitary conditions in her hospital. She'd done her best. She believed in good uh, sanitation, but she'd missed out on something to do with the sewers. Um, that she worked out from her data that infection was coming from the sewers and killing her patients. Okay, so using this data and other data from further studies she did, she developed advanced statistics, including uh, complex pie charts to develop a safe, hygienic hospital environment. All the things that are obvious to us now, but were far from obvious at the time, were developed by this exceedingly intelligent and capable woman. And she had quite a hold on some of the key men in politics at the time. They were very impressed by her. I think nowadays she would probably be a female prime minister. She was an exceptional woman. Um, in 1865, she established the first nurse training school at St. Thomas's in London. And the principles of her nurse training spread throughout the world. In 1874, she was the first woman to be elected to the Royal Statistical Society. And that is her crowning glory for me. She had many other honors bestowed on her, but to be the first woman elected to the Royal Statistical Society um, is very important and significant. So the last of my heroes is Austin Bradford Hill, a statistician who uh, building, again, I said, this, this is the, the, the jump from the Hippocratic tradition to modern research, to quantitative medicine in particular. He developed the idea of the large randomized controlled trial. In fact, he was responsible for the first ever large randomized controlled trial. And we mentioned smallpox 
and how important the uh, solution to that was. What was the solution to the other great killer of the, the era, which was tuberculosis? It was antibiotics, streptomycin in particular. So in 1948, um, he did a randomized controlled trial. And one of the important things is his method of randomization. He uh, had a way of uh, generating random numbers. You might think it would be enough to say, you want two groups, two different treatments, or in this case, streptomycin in one group, and uh, just ordinary treatment, but no streptomycin in the other group. That's the controls, the control compared with the active ingredient, okay? Um, so you might say uh, alternate patients go into each arm. That has been shown to be a big mistake. That doesn't give you a proper control group. It has to be random numbers, and he was a great statistician because he recognized this and developed it to a fine art. And you can see, obviously, in the streptomycin group, only four deaths, and in the non-streptomycin group, uh, more than three times as many. And much more besides. He developed the further development was the double-blind randomized control trial comparing an active ingredient with a placebo tablet. So this has become the gold standard uh, for research nowadays. It does have some weaknesses, but I won't go into that just now. It does have some weaknesses in certain areas of research, but for many things, it is the gold standard because the placebo effect is quite strong and you need a placebo arm. He did much more besides that. Um, in fact, it was he and his team that came up with definitive proof that smoking causes lung cancer. So there you go. Those are my 11 heroes. And uh, I would claim that with about, without Hippocrates, the history of medicine in the ancient world would have been a different story altogether. As I say, when he died, there was a great wailing and gnashing of teeth and people said, without Hippocrates, what can we do? It's just life won't be the same. Um, Paracelsus shook things up. Andreas, Andrea uh, Vesalius really got people thinking. Um, William Harvey put the last nail in the coffin of uh, Galen's mistakes. Uh, without Louis Pasteur, we'd have had no Joseph Lister. We'd have had uh, very little in the way of modern medicine for some time, maybe for another hundred years. So he made a major, major impact on the history of medicine. And without Florence Nightingale, how long would it have taken us to develop the modern hospital and modern nursing training? She was an amazing genius. And if she had never been born, medical history would have been very different. As for Austin Bradford Hill, who you maybe never have heard of, well, 95% of modern medical research uh, uh, owes it to him for developing the double blind control trial. If you want to know more about my views on science, medicine, and history, you might like to look at some of my books, uh, four books, but in particular, um, look at my website and you'll see excerpts from all these books. Uh, this is the book on nutritional medicine and a lot about Darwin and Hippocrates comes into it. Um, it is a book of short stories and there's quite a lot about the history of medicine and philosophy uh, and going from the distant past to the far distant future in that book that you might find interesting. So maybe just stop this recording for a while and make a note of my, my website because you'll find quite a lot of interest there. And I'm afraid that's me finished for now. So 
I'll say goodbye. Bye.